Okay, this week's lab we will be exploring the configuration and operation of various routing protocols, specifically RIP version 2, OSPF, and EIGRP. Um, the configurations required this week aren't real complex. You'll just be doing it several times on each router. Uh, but mainly what we'll be, we will be doing <clears throat> is kind of similar to what we did in uh, 220 in the routing protocols lab where we'll be pinging from one place to another place and then we'll cause some failures and see how long it takes for the routing protocol to notice the failures and uh, pick up the pings and uh, analyze that uh, based on what the book says that the uh, routing protocol should do and how things should work. So if you look at uh, my uh, network I've created here, uh, I have PCs with IP addresses, I have some routers connected, and then I have a switch in here. Uh, these PCs, they say 11.34, 11 11.2, 11 33.2, 33.34, and 22.34. They're all 192, 168 addresses. So anywhere you see 11.34 on the lab sheet, that means 192, 168, 11.34. So um, primarily we'll be pinging from 11.34 to 22.34. And then later on, 33.34. I don't think we use 33.2 at all, but it's out there for fun. Hey, why not? So, first thing we want to look at, this is the file you will download from A Desire to Learn. This file is already configured for RIP v2. Uh, see, we have little R's, which means RIP. If you do a show run, you'll see it's configured for RIP v2. And everything should be configured correctly. However, uh, if you look at the show IP route output, for some reason, I don't know if this is simulator related or uh, if this is actually a protocol um, issue based on the way I have my network set up. But for some reason in this in this network uh, with Ruby 2, I keep getting these statements like this. It's possibly down, routing via blah, blah, blah. So uh, I don't know, like I said, if this is a... Uh, protocol issue with the way my network is set up or if it's just a simulator being weird but we want to uh, the way I found to solve that is if we go in and <clears throat> if we go into the router rip config and disable auto summarization with a no auto summary command so we go do that on all the routers then uh, we will get more uh, accurate information I'll go ahead and do it on all of them. So we can talk about this. I'm not actually going to go through everything we're doing in the lab in this podcast. I'm just going to go through the config uh, steps that you need to know to be able to configure things. And then you're going to take the activities that you need to do to analyze the behavior of the routing protocols. But I will go ahead and do this part. I don't know why. And then one more. Router Ripo, Router Rip Equal. All right, so one thing to notice after we do this, we go over here and look at our routing table. We still have some stuff showing. Is it still showing up? Yeah, we still have some stuff showing down. It is possibly down routing via whatever. So the way Rip works is it holds on to routes for a while after they're down to make sure that it tells all its friends that the routes are down. So this may take a while to do that. I found that clear IP route star seems to speed things along. So if you get tired of waiting for it, <clears throat> you can run that command. And it should have gotten rid of all the bad routes. So what it actually does if I run show IP route clicker, if I clear it, and then look, all it has a connected route. So now you have to wait until the next routing update comes in, which with RIP, if you remember correctly, it's every 25 to 35 seconds that the routing updates come in. So once the next routing update comes in, then um, we will uh, get our routes back. 25 to 35 seconds. There we go. So now i got some routes back. 
and have none that are, are showing as possibly down. So, uh, with the Rip, what is the expected path the Packers are going to take? Well, Rip is a, uh, a, a uh, what is it called, distance vector, I think they call it the fancy word. Basically uses the hop count for for the uh, metric. So, this one hop from, from 11.34 to 22.34, this one hop across this slow serial link is one hop. This 100 megabit hop is one hop. This 100 megabit hop is one hop, and this 100 megabit hop is three is one hop. So that's three hops. So this way is longer than this way. So the path should the, the packet should be going across this link. And if I look at my show IP route output, this is 12.2 on this interface. So my next hop for 22.34 should say 12.2. 22.34, which is on the 32 network, 12.2. So it's going across the slow link. So then what we're going to do is we're going to call var cause various failures along the way to see how long it takes for the, for the uh, ping to come back and uh, see what the route looks like after the ping comes back. So what we'll do is we'll do a continuous ping, ping dash F, that's not it, dash T, 192.168.22.34. This will do a continuous ping. First one will probably fail because it usually does. So that's doing a continuous ping. We'll, we'll run the continuous ping, and then we'll take some actions to cause failures. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to shut down this serial interface, see what happens. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to move a port out of this VLAN. So essentially, you come onto the switch, you know, you go in here, show VLAN brief. We want to move, uh, we want to move this interface into a different VLAN. Right now, everything's in VLAN one, so we'll do int fa0 slash 2 switch port access vlan 2 i shouldn't have to tell you that at this point but anyway uh that's what we're going to do to cause the failure and then we're going to start a timer to see how long it takes for the failure to be noticed uh, so yeah so first we're going to disable serial link see how long it takes to notice that and fix that and then we'll move this switch port so the the packets are going across this link right now once we fail the serial link then the packets will be going like this all right, and then once we move this to a different VLAN, the packets will be going like this, taking a longer path, uh, the longest path. Why are we moving the the VLAN, the port to different VLAN? Well, if you take down the interface, it's going to fail in one way, and if you actually just disrupt communications, it's going to fail in a different way. So we're going to have it fail in a different way by just disrupting communications. But like I said, I'm not really going to go over all that right now. So basically, uh, this guy is all configured, ready to go. You just have to do no auto summary uh, under the router rip config to get it ready. Um, next thing we're going to do is enable OSPF. So I'll do it on a couple of the routers just to show you the process. First, we're going to disable router rip with no router rip. No router rip. And then we're going to enable OSPF with the command router OSPF1. The one's just a process ID. You need to put the same process ID on all the routers. Uh, I uh, think you can use different different instances of OSPF for different quality of, different types of service. I've never actually done that, so I don't know uh, how that works. <coughs> Sorry about that. I'm not really feeling all that well today, but podcasts need to be made. So, to enable uh, OSPF, you do a network. Uh, wildcard mask combination or multiple network wildcard mask combination and then you specify which area we're gonna be doing a single area config so everything will be in area zero and all of our addresses start with 192.168 so if we put 192.168.00 with a 00255255 wildcard mask then that basically says anything that starts with 192.168 uh, will be part of this OSPF process if you wanted to specify the full uh, octet the full you know network class C network that we're using we're using like 11.0 with a 0.0.0.255 or you could have and then you could have also entered a 12.0 with the same wildcard mask if you had multiple interfaces in the same subnet that needed to be in different areas then you could do something like this 12.1 you know 0.0.0.0 uh, area 0 and then you could have made the other one 12.7 or whatever it is, 
0.0.0.0 area 1 if that was something you're trying to do. But we don't need you to really worry about that. So I did that on this router. I'll go ahead and do it on this router too so that we can uh, see some stuff. Before I do that, I'm going to go ahead back over here and do some commands. Show IP OSPF question mark. These are some uh, commands that I want you guys to run to see what kind of information it tells you what might be useful in your uh, troubleshooting you may need to do later. Um, neighbor is a good one that tells you who your OSPF neighbors are. Right now I don't have any OSPF neighbors. And I'm going to turn on some debugging so we can look at some stuff uh, as we go along. I'm turning on event debugging and adjacency debugging and that will tell us some information uh, about what's going on with our OSPF processes. So I'm going to come over to this router and I'm going to do no router rip and then I'm going to do router OSPF 1 network uh, 192.168.0.0.0.0.255.0.0.255.255 if you screw up the wildcard mask and things don't work uh, it'll be screwed up and it won't work so here I did the uh, I enabled as soon as I did that a bunch of stuff showed up over here in the debug information undebug all to turn it off I'll turn it off because I don't want to keep scrolling while I'm trying to talk about it so we look, looked up here we see received a hello uh, from the neighbor we processed the hello in order for us to become neighbors with other routers a bunch of stuff has to match and there's a list of that in the book the I, the IP network and the subnet mask have to be the same, the hello uh, interval, the dead timers, all that kind of stuff has to be the same before we'll become neighbors. If uh, any of that stuff don't match, we won't become neighbors. And then we get some stuff and figure out who's going to be the uh, master and stuff, and then we exchange some database information. We exchange our link state database. And then we have a routing table. So here's my routing table so far. I've only got uh, the other router configured. So uh, one other thing about uh, OSPF is this holds true for e EIGRP as well. Uh, they use this bandwidth setting uh, in their metric calculations. So on your serial interfaces, your bandwidth should be set to match your clock rate. So if my clock rate was 128,000, my bandwidth needs to be 128. So that's to make sure that our router accurately calculates uh, the routing table based on accurate information. So you'll want to verify that the bandwidths are all set on all of your serial interfaces that you may be using uh, to the proper value. So uh, same thing here with OSPF. The OSPF smarter than RIP. So the uh, packet from 11.34 to 22.34 is going to go like this. Even though it's more hops, it's faster. It's going to go this way before the failure. We're going to cause a failure over here. After we cause a failure, then it's going to cross the serial link. Uh, and we'll time how long it takes for the failure to occur. And then we'll fix things and see what it looks like to go back. <clears throat> and then we're going to cause another failure. We're going to be uh, pinging 33.34 to cause a failure in this network. And uh, then we'll see what happens with that. So... Uh, I did these two routers for EIGRP. You'll need to configure these other four in the lab. Uh, looking at the routing table, make sure everything uh, is there, and then go on with uh, creating the failures. The last thing we're going to do is configure EIGRP. So, uh, same thing goes. We're going to do a no router OSPF. Uh, what the heck? No. Oh, process ID one. When we're going to do a router EIGRP process ID one, and then we're going to do a very similar network statement to what we did before, except EIGRP doesn't have the idea of areas, so we don't need the area for EIGRP. There are some show commands with EIGRP that might be helpful for us to to look at. Uh, interfaces will tell us about our interfaces that are using EIGRP, so that might be a helpful helpful command to run if something's not working right to see okay uh, are all my interfaces at least participating in EIGRP or uh, did I screw up my wildcard mask and some of them aren't. Um, what else do we have? 
neighbors. I don't have any neighbors yet. Neighbors. No neighbors yet because I didn't configure the other router yet. Topology. I probably don't have much of a topology either. Topology. Hey, I have my, my networks that I know about. So anyway, I'll go ahead and configure the other router. Uh, no router OSPF1. Router EIGRP1. Network statement. Network statement. So now, if I go back over here and show some neighbors, now I have a neighbor. Now I have more of a topology. And uh, that's really it for the SGRP config. For the basic config, uh, same thing. We're going to be pinging from here to here, which the expected route with EIGRP is along this faster path. Uh, and then we'll cause a failure, see how long it takes for EIGRP to notice, and then we'll do some other stuff uh, like that. So, as I said before, this uh, this lab's a little light on configuration commands and a little heavy on analysis of what's actually going on. So, uh, bring your thinking caps uh, so you can think about what's happening with the routing protocols and if the times that we're seeing are matching up uh, what we would expect uh, for the times uh, for a convergence uh, to happen with a particular given routing protocols. So uh, that's it.